building cognitive capacity. This has to be a relentless one. Now, the cognitive capacity is really the sum of all of the mental actions in one's brain. And it is, of course, correlated with enhanced learning and achievement. Examples of cognitive capacity tools would include mental skills. Mental skills like, for example, processing, attentional focus, and memory, and so forth. These are core mental skills. When students have these skills, they do pretty well in school. So the effect sizes of these cognitive skills, I shared with you relationship skills have a high effect size of a year and a half. Check out the numbers on this slide. You start building auditory language strategies like the way Fast Forward does. The effect size is over two years worth of gains teaching them problem solving, memory, graphic organizers, similarities, differences, and working memory training. These are crazy high effect sizes. That's why you want to be building cognitive skills with your students. Another thing that you might be interested in trying to decide which cognitive skills you want to build, if you ask the question, how are students different based on socioeconomic status, so on the far left, you see a really tall bar, the brown one. We're looking at differences between middle class students and those from poverty. And the bigger the bar, the bigger the effect size. Notice the ones where the arrows are pointing to. The biggest effect sizes are in brain areas of language and memory. Most teachers understand the language, but they don't know that memory is actually number two. So teach students simple peg systems, meaning hooks, like, for example, one is the sun, you know, two is uh, a shoe, or three is a tricycle because there's three wheels on it. Teach a simple peg system to kids so they can start memorizing things. You think you shouldn't teach memorizing. That's a huge mistake, and I just showed you why. For one, memorizing gives students confidence. Second, it reduces the cognitive load, meaning instead of having to hold it, everything in their head the first time, they already have a cue to attach it to. Now, there are plenty of different memory types. You have long-term memory, you've got short-term memory, you've got working memory. So quick quiz for you. Please check this quiz out that you see up on the screen. Which school-based factor, when tested at age five, actually predicts academic success even better than IQ? Go ahead, pick your answer. By the way, if you picked B or D, those are pretty good answers, but the correct one is E for working memory. Working memory actually is a better predictor than IQ. So how would you teach working memory? There are many ways to do it. I'm gonna share with you a couple quick things. First of all, if you would, please repeat this sound out loud. I know we're distance separated, but repeat the sound out loud. Da 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 da. Great. Now, by you doing that, was that an example of you using working memory, yes or no? Answer is no. That's short-term memory, short-term auditory memory. So working memory would be reassembling things in your head. For example, if I gave you three letters, such as B, C, A, and I said rearrange those in your head to make a word out of it. B, C, A, hopefully you came up with the word cab, C, A, B. So that's an example of using working memory. In your brain, working memory only stores sounds and images. Doesn't sound smells, touch, or other sensations. So in the classroom, students that can store sounds and images do better in school. Why? Working memory is a driver of cognition. It's required for every higher order thinking process. Kids in poverty have weaker working memory and this is a teachable skill. What's the effect size of working memory? First of all, 
At the K5 level, the effect size is 1.41. The secondary level, the average effect size is about 1.0, which is about two years' worth of gains. In other words, the effect size is huge. So here are some keys to remember when you teach working memory skills. First, make sure you get buy-in. Second, make sure you get a pre and a post, and make sure you tie this into meaningful goals that you have in the classroom, like tie it into reading skills, vocabulary, or math skills, and make sure you have an evidence path. Do this with interdependency, meaning either with a computer program or with another student partner. Make it easy to start off so there's a quick initial learning curve. Make sure it keeps getting harder and harder. Make sure there's good quality feedback so they know how they're doing. And if you're teaching this yourself, 10 to 14 minutes a day over a period of two to three months, and you'll see great gains in working memory. So what are the kinds of things you would do with struggling students? If you are starting off and doing numbers, by the way, you can do all kinds of things. The more your students struggle, the lower the grade levels, the simpler you start off. For example, with younger students, start off with objects. These could be objects that they have a picture of, or you write down the word lock, or a picture of a hammer, or eyeglasses, or a key. In other words, anything that's an object, ask students now, is that object closer to your right hand or your left hand? so they can start to visualize it, then say close your eyes with your eyes closed. Is that object now closer to your left or your right? Now move the object over to the other side. Now which is it closer to your left hand or right hand? In other words, with struggling students, you'll have to teach them how to visualize. Then teach them how to do this with pictures. So the pictures might be Okay, the, what's in front of you? And you could have, them have a duck and a dog and say, now close your eyes. What do you see in front of you? What are the two things? Name them. Good. Now switch the order of them. So now the duck's on the right and the dog's on the left. You get the idea until pretty soon you can add a banana to the group and pretty soon you can add an orange to the group. The bottom line is start where kids are at and slowly build till they can do these with 100% over and over and over. If you're going to work primarily with numbers, and by the way, you'll want to pick whether you're going to stay with numbers to build math skills or stay with words to build um, language skills. Don't do both because it, those are different pathways in your brain. Do one one year, one another year. So if you're going to do numbers, you might ask them, to say these numbers forward and then say them in reverse. They can do that while they're seeing it or while they're hearing it, but don't let them stare at the answers. So they'll give these two numbers. You say to them out loud, three, six, and then they say to you, three, six, and then they say, six, three. That's using working memory. Repeating it is simply short-term memory. You say 3-6 and they say 3-6, that's short-term auditory memory. But if you say 3-6, now say it backwards, they'd have to figure out, okay, what was first and what was last. Once they can do 20 pairs in a row at 100%, you know that you can do more. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with your students. Repeat them forward, then they say them in reverse order. So over time, they'll be able to do other things, like do them from smallest to greatest, not just reverse order, but smallest to greatest. Then when you switch over to ought to language systems, you can do things like this. You say the word to your students out loud, do, as in do this or do that. Ask them to spell that out loud, and they say D-O, great, you say. Now, spell it backwards. And they, in order to do that, they have to visualize it or they're going to take their hands and spell it out in front on their hands. That's the beginning of learning to visualize words. Pretty soon, they'll be able to visualize words like the word list you have. And you can use lots of words to help them get good at it. 
When they can spell 20 or 30 two-letter words backwards, they're ready for three-letter words. You can also do this for auditory working memory. Over time, not day one. I'm talking a month into this process. Give them three letters like ATR and ask them, how could you arrange ATR to form a word? Just one word. And they might eventually say art, A-R-T. Or maybe they say rat, or maybe they say tar. But over time, they'll get good enough to be able to make three words from each of these, but not the first day. Notice the kinds of things we're doing. Rearranging things in your head. That's the core difference between short-term memory and working memory. You'll have a, you have a whole list in your notes of, of strategies that you can use in the classroom for it. Here's a resource for you for working memory, a resource. Go to my website, jensenlearning.com backslash working memory, and there's about 40 slides that will help you build up your skills in teaching working memory. Now, once you've done that, you might say, is there an easier way? Well, first of all, you have to understand how the brain actually rewires itself. Number one, students have to what? they got to buy into it. Number two, the skills have to be coherent. Three, they have to keep increasing the complexity, the challenge in complexity. They need a quick, fast initial learning curve, so it starts easy. Their brains need error correction. Students need 10 to 15 minutes a day if they're doing this, this with partners, and if they're doing it on a computer-based program, they'll need between a half hour and an hour a day. Once they get it right, they still need practice. And they can build skills in working memory, in which subject area, the truth is, in any subject area. So notice what we're after. We want to build core cognitive capacity skills. And the ones that matter the most are working memory out of these. All of them are important. If you want to use a software system, most software systems that you can buy online help you get good at exactly what you're practicing online, such as squares, triangles, remembering where the hopscotch pattern was, that's what they do. They're good at it, that. But there's not much transfer to school. So boring or bad software programs are worse than none at all. Go for ones with a proven track record. So I don't support or endorse most programs, but I love the Fast Forward program, which is an option for you because it builds phonological processing, vocabulary, reading skills, and working memory. So these are the highly effective skills that you can teach to help kids get better. And out of those, the Fast Forward program is building the reading skills, the vocabulary, and the working memory. So that's a nice uh, solution, getting three out of ten.